Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to talk to you about Different Seasons by Stephen King. So, this book's an interesting one because it's four different novellas. One of them, you may well have heard of the movie, it's uh, a story by the title of Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. So, you've probably seen the film of that. The Body, I believe, was turned into one, uh, I can't remember what it's called. So we've got four different stories, uh, kind of set in four different seasons. So we've got, I'll read you from the blurb here. Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, a compulsive and bizarre story of unjust imprisonment and escape. Apt Pupil, a golden schoolboy and an old man with a hideous past join in a dreadful union. The Body, four young boys journey into the woods and find life, death and the end of innocence. And The Breathing Method, a macabre story told in a strange club of a woman determined to give birth no matter what. By the way, apologies for sounding really ill as well. It's because I have a cold. Bear with me. Hopefully the music and my decent microphone. Anyway, so what I thought I'd do, like I said, so far I'm literally filming this. This is the intro. Then I'm going to cut to, I'm going to review each of the novellas in this story in turn, as and when I read them, to keep the uh, thoughts fresh. And then at the end, I'm going to give the book an overall rating. So this this video is going to take place over the course of several days, if not a week, because it's 560 pages long in fairly small print. I mean, it's a Stephen King book. They quite often take a while to read. Let's get started with what I thought of Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, which I haven't finished reading at the time of filming. But Future Dane has what read and filmed. Over to you, Future Dane. So I finished reading Rita Hayworth and The Shawshank Redemption. It's weird because it's one of those stories where I thought that I'd read it in the past and then I did a little bit of research and couldn't find anywhere else that it had been published apart from in this book, which I haven't read. So I thought, okay, I can't have read it then. I'll go back in and I'll read it. And I read Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption and I'm still pretty sure that I read that somewhere in the past. I mean, obviously I kind of know the story anyway from the film, although I haven't seen the movie for at least 10 years and I've only seen it once or twice. So maybe it's something to do with the fact that it's kind of entered into popular consciousness. However, I just kind of knew the story from start to finish and it's not one of those where there's a great deal of twisting and turning. It's pretty linear, it takes place over 100 odd pages or so. So Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption tells the story of a man who's been accused of murder and sentenced to spend time in Shawshank prison. But he claims that he's innocent and he has to find a way to keep himself sane throughout the years he's there. So he develops this sort of passion for collecting and prospecting little rocks, little quartzes and stuff from the um, from the prison yard. There's basically a major spoiler that happens at the end of this story, which is kind of the only real thing that happens in the plot. It's very much, um, like I say, it's, it's, very, it's a very simple story, almost like a classical feeling story. It's quite different to a lot of Stephen King's other stuff. And for me, although although it was, you know, it's very well written and I enjoyed it enough, it didn't stand out enough to actually hold up on its own. I think the movie probably does a better job than the story because there really just wasn't enough here. I felt like it could have filled a whole book and would have worked a lot better like that. What I found as well is that Stephen King obviously also wrote The Green Mile and I tend to get uh, The Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile confused in my head, but now that I have recently read Shawshank Redemption, it makes me more clear on what Green Mile is about. And I'd recommend reading that ahead of this one if you want King's take on life in the prison system. I think in this book it just isn't complex enough. It could do with more. And you can kind of tell that it's his earlier writing as well. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I'm sure a lot of people really love this kind of novella. But I actually didn't enjoy it as much as Apt Pupil, the next one in this book, and I only gave Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption 3.5 out of 5 stars for a story. You know, it was fine. Let's take a look at Apt Pupil, which is the next story in this collection. Okay, so apologies if I sound awful today, I have a cold, but I want to talk about Apt Pupil while I remember it. Um, so, without further ado, let me get my notes. So Apt Pupil is about a school kid who is about 13, 14, and he's getting good grades. He's just an all-American kid, really. He's into sports and all this kind of thing. And he finds uh, some magazines in a friend's basement that are about the Second World War and the Holocaust and uh, the survivors fleeing and going to Argentina and burying Nazi gold and all of that kind of stuff. And as he's doing this, he recognizes somebody in one of the images and is able to follow this guy home. He happens to see him on a bus and follows this guy home. And he is a, uh, and this guy is an elderly Nazi who's living with a different name under a different identity. And basically, the kid, his name's Todd, 
he confronts this older guy. The older guy's name is Dussender. So it begins with basically this kid finds out that this old guy is a Nazi and he tracks him down to his house and manages to get his way into the house, confronts this old guy and he basically says, I know who you were during the Second World War. The old guy says, that's preposterous. I'm going to call the police. The kid kind of dares him to call his bluff. The old guy doesn't because obviously he doesn't want his true identity to come out. And that's when they start with this weird friendship. It begins with this kid, uh, with Todd. He has this really odd desire to know as much as possible about the Holocaust from this old guy, from this old uh, Nazi um, concentration camp leader. But the thing is, is it's not really a healthy desire, if you know what I mean. He wants to know all the gory bits. I think he calls them the gloopy bits. He calls them the gloopy bits. He's like, I want to know the gloopy bits. So he asks him to talk about his experiences. So he'll be like, okay, tell me about the different gases you used in the gas chamber, for example. And this old guy will reluctantly tell him about it. I mean, this guy has tried to put his past behind him. And what's interesting is that as Todd presses him for more and more answers, he starts to kind of regress more and more into this past life. Todd actually buys him a replica Nazi uniform and makes him wear it. And then to begin with, it's kind of awful for this old guy. And then as he gets more and more used to wearing it, he finds he actually can't sleep without it. He has these weird nightmares. And Todd starts having these nightmares as well. And that's what brings us to the kind of crux of this story, is that the two of them actually have interlinked destinies, I suppose you would say. So I've written down here, the kid initially tries to blackmail the, the guy by saying, you know, tell me everything you know, otherwise I will go public and tell everyone who you are. And then the situation kind of changes where they become kind of symbiotic. So after a while, it gets to the point where the old man says, yeah, but your parents know that you come here. His parents think he's just reading to the old guy because the old guy is losing his sight, which actually isn't true as well. He's he's pretty healthy for, a, for an old Nazi. After a while, the, the German guy, the old guy, after a while, he says to Todd, um, you know, if you do go public and say all this about me, you're in just as much trouble as I am because they're going to want to know or why were you still coming round and all this kind of stuff. As with all of the books in this collection, it's an oldie but a goodie. Obviously, I'm talking about um, an elderly Nazi here. I think he was in his 70s in this book because this was set in like 1976 or something. One of the really cool things about that is actually this was written closer to the end of the Second World War than to the modern day. And really, it doesn't feel old or outdated. Oh, there goes my bookmark. Now, actually, this guy, this old guy, he's actually really likeable for an old Nazi. I don't know what it is about him. I think it's because he's very flawed as a character. He's fallible and he knows that and he doesn't like he's not proud of his past, at least not to begin with. And it's only when this kid basically bullies him into reliving all of these old memories that actually, you know what I mean? He then starts to think about it more and then that's when he can't get rid of the ideas and there is a big spoiler. Skip ahead 20 seconds if you don't want to hear the spoiler. You ready? Alright, spoiler. Basically, this old guy and the kid, they both end up killing homeless people. And they're both doing it independently of each other. But, again, because their destinies are linked, they both become these like weird homeless serial killers. It's messed up. Alright, spoiler's over. We're going to assume that if you don't want the spoilers, you have successfully skipped that spoiler-filled bit. I think for a video review like this, where it's in-depth, you kind of need the spoilers, so... I put down here, it subverts the classic evil Nazi trope, while simultaneously kind of creating it. I mean, King himself as a writer has kind of created all sorts of these different tropes that we see throughout literature. The other thing I wanted to mention about this story as well is it has the bleakest ending ever. Like, it's really bleak. Uh, it's probably not the bleakest of all of Stephen King's endings, actually, but it was pretty damn bleak. And it's one of those where, like, two pages before the ending, you're like, I don't know how this is going to end, what's going to happen? And then it ends and you're like, Jesus, I need a drink. <laughs> so, that's what I thought about Apt Pupil. Okay, so just a quick update, I've finished reading The Body, so the premise here, four young boys journey into the woods and find life, death, and the end of innocence. Basically, the idea here, it's almost like a coming-of-age story, but with a Stephen King spin on it. So these four lads who go out into the woods, they actually, they're going in search of a dead body. So there's a kid from a neighbouring town who went missing, uh, and nobody knows where he went, and they decide to go and try and find his dead body. And all four of these kids, they all come from kind of bad backgrounds, so whether they've got abusive 
fathers, for example, or um, there's there's each of them has got something kind of bad going on at home. And I guess this is kind of their story. They try and kind of come to terms with that as they go in search of these bodies. It's actually been turned into a movie as well. Let me find the name of the movie. Yes, yeah, so it was adapted into a film called Stand By Me, if you've seen that, which I haven't. This is literally from Wikipedia because I, I didn't pay enough attention to this book as I was reading it to remind all, remember all of this stuff. So there are four kids. There's uh, Gord, uh, Gordy and his older brother Dennis was killed in a car accident uh, and his parents have kind of ignored him since then. Chris is regularly abused by his alcoholic father and his older brother. Teddy's dad had PTSD after coming back from World War II and he burned Teddy's ears against a stove and then ended up getting put in a sanitarium. And then there's Vern. Vern is harassed by his older brother. So there we go, those are the four characters. They say that they're gonna have like a camp out in the garden and then they sneak off and go out into the woods and then they begin this long adventure. And there are things like they go across a railway bridge, for example, and a train's coming and all of this kind of stuff. It's typical, almost like boy scouty kind of stuff. I guess, but again with a Stephen King kind of twist on it. Nevertheless, I didn't think it was particularly good and, uh, you know, I read it and I soldiered on through it and it was fine, but it wasn't his best. It was one of the weaker stories in this uh, collection so far. Uh, I'll give it a 3 out of 5 stars. It was okay. It wasn't great. But I am now about to start reading The Breathing Method, and I'm kind of excited about that. Okay, folks, so I've read the last story in this, which is The Breathing Method. The Breathing Method's a weird one because it kind of, it's kind of two stories in one. So it starts basically this guy gets invited to join this sort of private gentleman's club where they all tell stories and it's a very mysterious place. And so he, he follows up on this, invest, in, on this invitation, he goes along to the gentleman's club and while he's there he hears this tale of this woman who was pregnant and it's this tale within a tale that is kind of the point of this story. Now it's not a super long one, it's about 80 pages long and King actually manages to pack quite a lot in. The premise here on the back it says, a macabre story told in a strange club of a woman determined to give birth no matter what. Now for me reading that, that makes me think she's determined to give birth, which means she's determined to get pregnant, so she's doing whatever she can to get pregnant, but no that's not the case. Basically, this doctor who's telling the story he had this young woman come into his office one day and this was, you know, back in the days when uh, pregnant unmarried women were sort of frowned upon. And this woman comes into his office and she's clearly pregnant. And she's a very strong woman. She knows exactly what she wants. She wants to keep the baby. She actually pays for a hospital stay in advance because she doesn't want to, you know, she says, I want the baby to be first and foremost in my thoughts. So I need to put the money down now so I don't spend it you know, in the meantime. I don't want to give away the ending, but this follows what then happens to this woman as she goes through this pregnancy and eventually she goes into labor. And there is a big old twist, but the twist is actually hinted at or explained in the story before it happens, so you know it's coming. But let me tell you, it's pretty, um, if you're squeamish, you won't like it. But anyway, this woman gives birth in very unusual circumstances. It's very graphic. So overall then, Different Seasons by Stephen King, four novellas. 550 odd pages, just over a week of my life. I've talked about all the different stories, and so now it's time for me to give my, the book my overall rating. And I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it a four out of five. There are a lot of times when I was reading this that I kind of just wanted to put it down and move on to something else, but I stuck with it and got to the end. And it was very rewarding for all of that. So it was a four out of five, but it was also a very long read and you would have to be in the mood for it. I don't think I would recommend this to people who aren't already Stephen King fans. And if you are going to pick it up and read just one story, I would say read Apt Pupil. That one for me was my favourite of the four. So thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you like this video and want more reviews. Leave a comment to let me know if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of the different stories in there. And I will see you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.